plug the camera? Oh, where's the camera? Oh, okay. On this side. I'm just holding it. Holding it. I guess holding it. Another question for Tim. Shall we? Let's break for about. We have Anthony D'Agostino. We're an hour behind schedule at this point, but let's break for maybe 15 minutes, and then we'll start with Anthony, and then we'll have Bert West. Yeah, thank you. In case you didn't tell, that was actually a plug for the next two books. Pardon? Yeah. That was a plug for the next two books. Ah, okay. <laughs> well, okay. It works well. Actually, I had the, almost the whole thing written out. It was 900 pages, and nobody's going to read the damn books. I split it. Yeah. Anyhow, gentlemen, I hate to come to the money part, but twenty Yeah, I can't. 
Okay. I got your <laughs> Did you put you to sleep? No. When my daughter, the first time she read it the next morning, I asked her what did she think about it. And she said, oh, great. It's 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 great. Thank you, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. If you don't mind having a huge talk. 
So John needs to go to the Yes, it's great. It's 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 right on the way. I mean, I'm going back. Maybe five, six, so yeah. Um, Actually, I'll, I'll ask you. Uh, you think it's a good time for when? I think it's around nine. So we'll probably leave, need to leave around eight thirty. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, this time of night, the traffic should be a problem. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> the restaurant, it's not, well, it's probably a mile and a half to the freeway. Once you've got the freeway, it's a straight shot. Then it's actually not there. Again, this time of night, it should be better. Yeah. Uh, so though, I went uh, to Sunnyvale yesterday, and it's around seven. It was so much traffic. Uh, it yeah. Sounds, well, it Friday, was Friday night. night. Friday night. Yeah. 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 That worst. Yeah. That time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's a little late, but yeah. 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 All right. Yeah. But tonight should be fine. Okay. Well, you're new, Jim. Thank you. John, if you want to start with this one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Rick is, I just watched you. You were the chief of the finance. You were all the area. You were all the practice. Oh, you give me that dress? Oh, no, ma'am. No, What's the Look at that. It used to work. It does. Yeah. Oh, that never went wrong. I mean, I've always said that's the problem. I'm going to read your I'm trying to think it's 
Señor, señor Brown, ¿cuánto cuestan los libros? I don't know how much I paid for mine. I had my one thing I, I when I got on the plane. <laughs> I realized I left my 
copy at home. Shall we get started? Shall we get started? And they're uh, all right. <laughs> I see everyone is is bonding very, very successfully, and lots of conviviality. <laughs> Gracias a Tamara que está escuchando. Muy bien. Sí. Muy bien. Aplausos. All right. Wage slaves, dead peons. Stand up and be counted. Okay. Uh, we'll continue with our penultimate talk of this rather warm day but I think warm both in the literal atmospheric sense and in the, in the intellectual sense. So it's a pleasure to introduce Anthony D'Agostino. He's another Weisser that I've communicated with for many years and I haven't met, I believe maybe I met him at an earlier conference, but we didn't have the chance to talk. Um, so I'm, I'm, whoa, I'm very happy that Anthony could join us from San Francisco State University is a professor of history, and his talk is titled World History in the Era of Globalization, 1968, very key year in our history, to 2000. So here's Anthony D'Agostino. <laughs> going to places where you've never been, pretending just nothing but a chicken. No, I just want to turn the page. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> so uh, I'm uh, I'm Mr. Penultimate. Uh, I'm a diplomatic historian and. Um, uh, I've been associated with uh, Weiss for many, many, many years. Uh, uh, Ronald Hilton uh, uh, used to uh, pay a certain amount of attention to me. Uh, you know, I like that idea, and uh, and he and he asked me to come to Weiss and uh, to speak a couple of times, and I ended up coming and speaking about um, um, some of the topics of the first Weiss conferences, but uh, they all revolved around um, globalization. So I always gave globalization talks. And um, my globalization talks nearly always revolved around the idea uh, that there was a, uh, an idea that had taken hold that um, uh, globalization was pretty much a process of geoeconomics superseding geopolitics. And so I um, would give my talks, I think I give two or three of these already, I give my talks essentially arguing against that idea, suggesting that uh, the, um, uh, the old state is still around, that uh, geopolitics still counts, that uh, realism still counts in the old-fashioned sense that uh, perhaps we read uh, Hans Morgenthau or Reinhold Niebuhr sometime in our in our youth and uh, that these old verities uh, they still they still uh, in here in uh, world politics today so that used to be my argument that I would make um, at, the, at these conferences and so I, I'm uh, almost getting ready to do the same thing today but um, I have to, begun to think a little bit differently about it now and uh, I have the feeling that geoeconomics maybe is not uh, so, uh, how shall I put it, uh, that it is not so feeble as I once thought, and that uh, geopolitics perhaps is uh, taking rather a back seat, at least to some degree, um, uh, to geoeconomics. And so my ideas are changing about that. Uh, writing about this thing and talking about this thing at, at some length, um, uh, I got started uh, working on a book. 
And uh, so and this book is sort of happening dis despite me. I've written five books on international politics, and the last one was on the era of the world wars. So in a certain sense, it's a sort of a sequel uh, to write on the, uh, the period uh, uh, between um, 1968 and 2008 to try to do an, an international history of that period. I don't think anybody has tried to do this. There's plenty written about that stuff. Uh, there's quite a bit about globalization written in the present tense, but there isn't any real history of that period. And moreover, uh, there isn't any real history that combines geopolitics and geoeconomics, or at any rate tries to trace uh, the interplay. So I thought maybe I could make a contribution with that. At any rate, it's happening uh, despite me. And, uh, and so I, eventually this, this book may appear. Who knows? If, I, if I'm still around by that time, it may still appear. Um, and I wonder if there should be a chapter somewhere in the beginning. Table of contents may be number two, maybe number one, about um, um, a globalization in history, you know, some kind of general chapter um, that asks the question whether there's anything in history uh, that tells us something about globalization. Uh, the number of books that have suggested this, number of articles that have suggested this, there's a big collection done by um, Hopkins, of Kane and Hopkins, uh, who did the big uh, study of imperialism. And, but I thought uh, many of the essays in that thing went nowhere uh, and uh, really sort of didn't make much sense to talk about prior globalization. So when you really get down to it, uh, there's no prior globalization uh, to what we're seeing today. There, there is one case. There is England in the 19th century. Now, a number of people have written about that. It becomes a fairly simple story then. England in the 19th century, is it a model? Is it a caution uh, for us in the in the 20th century, and I guess that comes to be the heart of the thing. So considering it in those terms, in terms of military and political hegemony, um, every economist from C. Fred Bergston to Martin Wolf has uh, seemed to take as a given what might be called the hegemony theory of money, um, that any dominant currency in a, in a financial order owes specifically to the political military dominance of one state. That is, globalism depends on the hegemony. Of, uh, of one state. Now, this is right next door to Charles Kindleberger's idea of the hegemonic stability theory. They could be invited to the same family, family picnic. The hegemony theory has kind of a simple history then. Uh, only two cases worth considering, the globalism of our own time and the 19th century hegemony of the, uh, of the British under the gold standard. Um, so as a historian, I'm particularly interested in this. Uh, I'm kind of resistant to comparisons of uh, British and U.S. imperialism, but I'm willing to suspend my doubts about this and ask if there are some lessons uh, in the 19th century for today's globalization. Uh, the first thing we might say is that along with the hegemony of the British Navy went to kind of an intellectual hegemony of the British political economy. It's all well known to us, the labor theory of value, the division of labor, um, laissez-faire, uh, the unseen hand, and most important, Ricardo's idea of the law of comparative advantage. Uh, so this is sort of the ideology of, of England uh, during the period when she was the workshop of the world, and uh, so she was. Um, but she failed in the final analysis, I think, to reshape the whole world according to the Ricardian division of, of labor. Uh, her share of world trade decreased as the 19th century wore on. Uh, Britain was still a great exporter at the end of the 19th century, but um, she took an inc increasingly, or I should say, a, a decreasing share of the exports, and, um, and challengers were coming up. The United States was coming up, uh, Germany was coming up, and Britain didn't have that same kind of uh, supremacy in, in that regard. In fact, um, she wasn't um, uh, really in bad shape. She was still a big exporter, but uh, often she was importing more by the end of the century, she was importing more than she was exporting, and it was all made good by the so-called invisibles, shipping charges, insurance premiums, um, um, bankers' fees, uh, profits on foreign investment, the invisibles. Uh, so in effect, her trade was suffering, but um, her, how shall I put it, financialization would be the right word, I think. Her financialization was in effect uh, picking up the slack. Britain was emerging, in short, as a, a rentier economy. Uh, in today's terms, though, we consider a rentier economy to be a mature economy. And we consider it a more or less natural process for a country that's a big industrial producer and that has some kind of influence over affairs. Well, one of these days, in its, in its, in its uh, development, to, uh, to go over into finance. Uh, and we consider that quite, quite, a, normal, quite a normal idea. 
Um, and indeed, I think it is. One economist has said that uh, most of us save uh, until we don't have to work, and that countries do the same thing. So maybe, maybe there is something to that idea that it's quite natural. And once you look at it that way, you don't uh, get so, uh, how shall I put it, um, you're not so um, uh, funereal about the British declinism in the 19th century. You can say they are, they are losing their place to be sure, they have challengers to be sure, uh, their economy is being reshaped, uh, being financialized, I guess, to some degree as you go on, uh, but maybe it's not fatal. Uh, that leads you to the delightful thought that maybe it's not fatal today, that maybe our financialization is not going to, uh, take, us to take us to ruin. Um, so there, 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 is an, there is an idea there at, at, at any rate. Um, um, and the other thing about uh, Britain in the 19th century was that she was some, uh, she had this hegemonic uh, ideology, but it was challenged, and challenged right from the beginning. Um, Friedrich List's uh, famous book, uh, The Foundations of National Economy of 1841, makes the opposite case of the ideology of, of uh, British political economy. It says, the English got their position by means of import substitution. In the final analysis, uh, free trade in the end was, as Bismarck called it, the weapon of the strong. Uh, and that no, no, no country can really f arise without protecting its infant in industries. Um, and of course, we all recognize this is an American argument. He takes it from Alexander Hamilton. And uh, I mean, it's going to continue to be an American argument. The Republicans will be arguing essentially that way. They'll be protecting uh, the U.S. economy with high tariffs right down, well, pretty late in the, pretty late in the game, into the 50s, I think you might say. So. Um, uh, there's a, a correspond I should say, a, a competitive national economy, competitive political economy uh, uh, afoot in the world. And uh, I guess it's no accident that the Germans adopted a, a protective tariff in 1879, and then a lot of other European countries went the same way, adopted protective tariffs. And they might even draw the conclusion that maybe tariff protectionism uh, was becoming the rule under the gold standard. There's two ideas that are not normally put together in the same sentence. Uh, they, they were increasingly adopting the gold standard, and they were getting increasingly protectionist at the same at the same time. Well, there it is. That's the uh, at the last decades of the 19th century. And even Joseph Chamberlain, at the end of the thing, even Joseph Chamberlain made a very stern argument for protectionism in in England at the turn of the century. Um, the growth of other economies, then the United States, Germany, France, meant a decreasing share of world trade for Britain, and it was feared that Britain was living on its, on its invisibles. Uh, and moreover, the speculation and panic were the norm. Uh, and you can say that these panics are getting greater. On the other hand, maybe they weren't getting greater. Uh, Marxism uh, took up a real debate in 1897 when Edward Bernstein made the argument that they were, were, not, getting, were not getting greater, that the panics are slowing down. Maybe a really severe panic is a product of the Sturm und Drang period of early capitalism, and that, that capitalism uh, tosses off as it gets as it gets rolling. Um, well, of course, that's given the lie by the big crash, the real Great Depression uh, in uh, in the 1930s. They used to call the period from 1873 to 1896 the Great Depression, but they dropped that as soon as the real Great Depression came along. Um, and what happened during the real uh, uh, Great uh, Depression to ang Anglo Anglobalism? That's the, that's the term that uh, Neil Ferguson uses. Um, in the Great Depression, um, uh, the cyclical rhythm of capitalism apparently appeared uh, to be more and more violent. And so it, the question that we have to ask then is, um, was it made more violent by globalization? I haven't got a real answer to this question. I'm just tossing it out, I'm sure. Uh, the people in this room who demonstrate frequently over the years their opinions about, have, have, have solid opinions about a lot of things. I'm sure they may have some opinions about this. But we could say that maybe there's a kind of a correspondence between the depression and the gold standard. The way the gold standard acted in the depression, it more or less enforced deflationary policy, enforced austerity. And it made the uh, depression, in my opinion, made the depression more severe. Or at any rate, I would adopt Ben Bernanke's uh, uh, observation about that, that countries did better the quicker they got off the gold standard. 
on that, more or less is the conclusion of Barry Eichengreen's great study on that golden, golden fetters. Um, so maybe there's a correspondence to today's European uh, Union, it's the Eurozone. Maybe the Eurozone is acting like the gold standard and is forcing uh, all the member countries to, uh, um, to adopt austerity in order to be, uh, to be part of the international system. Well, all these are all fascinating things and uh, there's various things that you can argue on all of these things. And um, I'm, I'm fa as fascinated with anybody about it, but I'm not under the, um, uh, uh, the illusion that I'm going to say something so original that all the people who have written about it in the past are going to salute me. That doesn't always happen uh, to people who write, who write books. Um, so, uh, you know, there it is, the economic side of it. Um, and uh, that, it's worth debating. But for me, uh, the heart of the matter, the thing I really want to write about, the thing I want to really, how shall I put it, crow about, um, is the other side of the thing, the politics, the international politics of globalization. Uh, the idea that uh, globalization means real hegemony, real hegemonic power. Uh, here we come into the hegemony theory of money again in a really strong way. The gold standard regime, in effect, needs a military hegemon uh, for its security. And how to provide for this security in a pluriverse of nations, as uh, Carl Schmidt called it, a pluriverse. When we look at international politics, we see not a universe, but a pluriverse of nations. And uh, Britain was a, a hegemon, but not so tough as to be able to dictate uh, to the whole world during that period. So how is it going to run the security system under this, uh, that in effect uh, supports this globalization? How is it going to do that? Why? By the balance of power. Balance of power is going to do it. It is going to uh, look at international politics as an arena in which it uh, acts to reduce challengers, to reduce, to, you know, to induce combinations and to act in such a way as to reduce the power of possible rising challengers. And that's just the way uh, we were talking in the 1990s when the Project for the New American Century published its papers and some of the papers from the outgoing uh, George Bush administration published some of their papers. We were saying the most natural stuff in the world. Soviet Union had fallen and uh, now as hegemon, as the last remaining superpower, uh, it was really incumbent on us to try and reduce challengers to try and keep other people from rising up uh, to challenge that that position. Um, well, um, the 19th century then, uh, if the British were trying to do that in the 19th century, that was the idea of the balance of power. Um, how did they fare? Not too well. They didn't, uh, they did, were not successful in reducing challengers. Um, in fact, uh, uh, the balance of power idea in the 19th century, and this for me is the most interesting part about the whole discussion, the balance of power idea in the 19th century only emerged really at the end of the Napoleonic Wars in full force when the Austrians took it up and when Metternich, uh, Prince Metternich said, we're going to have a real conservative order in Europe based on a consensus of values uh, and we will act against revolution. That was the real balance of power, the idea of a European equilibrium, uh, Britain uh, presumably in league with Metternich, there's their balance of power. But the, uh, the British did not pursue this conservative idea in the 19th century. Um, the, they gave up entirely, really, on the system of European equilibrium. They did not defend the Vienna system. When the French made the revolution in 1848, and just by way of footnote here, uh, all the historians say the, French, the revolutions of 1848 failed, wrong. They did not fail. In France, they brought back the French Revolution. The whole idea of all the revolutions of 1848 was to bring back the French Revolution on an international scale. And uh, they brought back the French Revolution in the figure of a new Napoleon, Napoleon III. So they went back to a Napoleonic, very revolutionary policy in international affairs. It didn't, of course, bring back Jacobinism or anything like that. But uh, in international affairs, it was highly revolutionary, I mean, revolutionary line. And the British were all for it. They weren't conservative at all. Uh, they went with Napoleon into Crimea and fought the Russians. And the Russians were one of the guarantors of the conservative order. Um, so there, there was no real action against the, uh, against the balance of power in the middle of the century. And they went with Bonaparte uh, throughout the 1860s. Bonaparte you know, wanted to unify Italy against, once again against Austria. Everything uh, that changes the world is against Austria. Gladstone himself once said, Put your finger on a map and see if you can say 
that there was a place that uh, Austria did good. I defy you. You, you cannot. Yeah. So, um, so it's all against Austria, and that's the spirit of the British. They're revolutionaries. They're not uh, fighting for the balance of power. There's nothing conservative about, about their policy. Results in the rise of England. Result, uh, excuse me. Results in the rise of, of Italy. Results in the rise of Germany. And Germany is going to be a big competitor uh, for the British. And at the same time, they had a chance, maybe, to reduce the power of the United States. Uh, the United States had to win that civil war. Otherwise, it was going to end up maybe four countries in North America. There might have been Napoleon's, Fran uh, uh, excuse me, Napoleon's Mexico, uh, one power. Uh, might have been an American South, maybe even an American West as a sovereign country. A real balance of power. That would have been in the British interest. Wouldn't have had to worry about the United States uh, bothering them in the 20th, 20th century. But they didn't do that. They didn't do that. They fell in with Lincoln. Uh, they were afraid in the end about Canada, uh, and that they couldn't really fight on, on the mainland. Uh, in other words, they couldn't. They didn't because they couldn't. Uh, they may have wanted to be a real hegemon and to enforce a balance of power, just like us. Might have wanted to be a real hegemon, but you can't hold the whole world down. You can't do it. It's too much. And it's not so easy to organize coalitions against every challenger that comes up. Uh, nobody's been able to do it so far. Uh, so maybe that is part of the lesson that's facing us. Britain did not play the role in the 19th century of the offshore balancer. And so I'd be surprised if the United States in the 21st century is going to be able to play, going to be able to play that role. Um, instead, Britain looked for a way to profit from the rise of Germany in the United States. You can call this appeasement, if you like, or a, a more neutral term, condominium, trying to live with the challenger, trying to live with a big, uh, with a big power. And, uh, or the political science people would say, not balancing, but bandwagoning. Not balancing, but bandwagoning. That was Britain was, that was what Britain was doing. That they were bandwagoning. Uh, and in the process, it paid in some way. Britain scrambled for colonial possessions under those circumstances. But others did just as well. So there's a scramble for Africa, scramble for concessions on the China coast, Scramble for the world, I, I call it in my uh, uh, rise of the, of the global powers, you know, international politics in the era of the world wars. I call it a scramble. In fact, that was going to be the original title, except uh, uh, the, uh, the publishers said, look, why don't we try uh, rise of global powers? It'll be bought like Paul Kennedy's book, Rise and Fall of the Great Powers. And my eyes started to, I started going, I got uh, starstruck for a second there. So, but I, that was wrong. I, I made a mistake. Uh, scramble for the world was much more accurate description of, what, of what's described in that, in that book. So um, uh, Britain took much of the spoils due to the naval hegemon and the solitary world power. And Britain let the Vienna system decay. And the Austrians disappeared entirely in the First World War. At the dawn of world politics, Britain looked up uh, from the European balance. It was an important thing uh, that was emerging by the turn of the 20th century was not the European balance, but the, the world balance. Britain looked up there and said it had mainly two powers uh, to deal with. It had Germany and the United States. In Venezuela in 1895, and then again in 1902, the United States decided that it was going to uh, defy the British and imposed the Monroe Doctrine. And the British decided that they were going to let the United States do that. So from that point on, a special relationship developed between the United States and Britain. That meant that it was impossible to come to terms with Germany. That is to say, impossible for Britain to come to terms with Germany. Germany wanted to be a world power. Germany wanted everything that comes up in the world, Hawaii, Samoa, everything that comes up in the world. Uh, uh, subjected to a conference into which it would walk and say, uh, I'm a world power, I'm entitled to compensation. And the British, uh, those things did come up, and the British decided, no, we're with the United States. So never possible for the Germans and the, uh, and the British to come to terms, as all the historians who taught me uh, were fond of thinking. It was, it was never possible, and it's because of this decision. Three great powers, and the two of them, that's going to, they're going to be against the one or the United States and Britain against Germany. And so it was. And uh, that's how the world wars, 
That's how the World Wars went. So um, World War I was the wreck of globalization and the, uh, and the, and the gold standard, uh, but not of British financial hegemony. The, uh, the, the Brits still hang around, and their navy too. The navy too is a hegemonic navy. We've got just as many ships in the uh, 20s and the 30s as the British do, but they've got uh, ports everywhere around the world. We're really only able to project power into the Mediterranean, or excuse me, into the Caribbean, and uh, on a straight line out to the Philippines. You know, the road to the Philippines, which uh, Teddy Roosevelt called our Achilles heel. So the United States was, uh, had as many ships, but uh, the British are still hegemonic, I think, uh, in the naval category in the 20s and, and in, the, uh, in the 30s. Uh, Britain abandoned, however, its globalist ideals uh, by the uh, depression. Uh, the British decided to go for protection. The Ottawa system, um, empire free trade. So they're protectionist. They believe that they're in a world of trade blocks, that uh, the fascist powers have their trade blocks, and so does Britain. And everything is going to be divided up from that. And forget about globalization. The globalizer there is the United States, who wants to fight fascism. In the end, forces it on the British, force them to end appeasement in 1938 and 1939. Um, and so finally, when they do end appeasement, we get a, how to put it, a war for an American balance of power and not a British, not a British balance of power. So um, what's the lesson from all of this stuff um, uh, for future hegemons? What's the lesson from the era of the first globalization for future, future hegemons? Um, first, um, the hegemon uh, can't keep all the others down, as those papers that were written for the United States in the 1990s uh, hoped to do. You, you can understand the desire. Once you're on top, you're not going to let anybody else uh, challenge you. Uh, but it just, it's, not as, it's not as easy to do as to say. Um, the hegemon uh, has to, in effect, accommodate in some way. Uh, condominium and appeasement um, has to be done. Uh, it's the natural impulse of the hegemon, uh, but it doesn't work either. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't work either. It, it, the hegemon can't stay out of the quarrels of others. In fact, it needs these quarrels uh, for balance, uh, in the sense that maybe the United States sort of needs a quarrel between China and Vietnam today uh, to have a real trans-Pacific partnership in, uh, in the Pacific. Uh, to have a combination against China it needs this quarrel, maybe, with, uh, with Vietnam. Uh, the hegemon is not helped by its rentier status. Uh, in fact, a rentier status makes things worse. It subsidizes a chaotic speculation. It supports foreign investment in rival powers, helps them to rise to challenge the hegemon. It aids the rapid rise, therefore, of the challengers. In short, the economic policy of the rentier power uh, cuts against its ability to balance. And that's where all the security of the system apparently, apparently resides. Uh, this would suggest a strong note of caution to the United States today in its presumed role as the hegemon, the revolutionary power that seeks, seeks to expand democracy to the ends of the earth, the mature financial power guiding the new world or order. Okay, so th those are my arguments. Uh, some of them I think are quite original. You should all pick me up and put me on a chair and carry me around the room. Hoorah! <laughs> <laughs> Hoorah! <laughs> but, um, but wait a second, but wait a second. Okay, Even after you have said, <laughs> oh, I'm not finished yet. Okay. Two more minutes. Even after you have said, <laughs> It did sound like it closed. <laughs> Even after you have said all this, all this stuff, um, there's a um, there there's a, a contrary note. Um, history may not be much of a guide to world politics today. Now we historians, you know, we hate this idea, but. It may not be much of a guide. It might be good for people to know history, but just as good for them to, you know, put aside some of it. At any rate, uh, transcend some uh, some of it. Um, uh, challengers, uh, particularly, don't observe all the historical lessons. It was said just a little while ago that the Chinese had read Friedrich List. They knew all about national economy. They were so clever. Blah 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 blah. They were going to um, have a a, a, 
a rise, a peaceful rise. And the model was Bismarck. You know, Bismarck took some colonies in the uh, 1880s, and then he said the colonies basically are going to be hostages to British naval power. We haven't got a navy uh, to protect them, so we've got to play ball with Britain. Uh, and that is the essence of British, uh, excuse me, the essence of Bismarck's policy. So you think the Chinese, or anywhere I was of the impression, uh, that the Chinese had learned from this, we're really going to take seriously this idea of the peaceful rise. Let's not be like Germany. Let's not, you know, start challenging the Americans on the high seas. And there they are uh, off the coast of Syria uh, uh, with all of their uh, uh, airplanes on, a, on a, uh, an aircraft carrier getting ready to join with the Russians in this campaign against, against ISIS. My thing what kind of peaceful rise is that? I mean, uh, so they don't, they, the challengers don't obey the rules of history, and sometimes you might even argue they don't learn uh, from history. The hegemon uh, has a seductive experience as well um, from the Cold War that I think needs to be shaken off um, with deterrence. Uh, we got away with murder uh, in the Cold War uh, when it comes to deterrence. We deterred all sorts of behavior that I don't think we can <coughs> count on deterring in the future, and, and, and particularly the extension of deterrence. That's the main thing. We extended deterrence to NATO. <coughs> now we are extending deterrence to Estonia, and who knows, one of these days we're going to be extending it to to, to Georgia or to Ukraine or something like that. Oh, and extending deterrence to countries that are actually engaged in fighting uh, with, a, with an enemy who's going to be your enemy more than it's going to be theirs. Uh, so maybe we have got too much confidence from history um, about deterrence and ought to be a little bit more, uh, a little bit more careful about how, how we go in the future. Um, also new is the, is, is the idea of QE, um, uh, quantitative easing, printing money, uh, rescue, uh, rescuing uh, the big financial institutions from the, uh, from the crash. Um, it was said that this was for temporary recapitaliz recapitalization, but it might be for a downward spiral of moral hazard uh, that goes down in indefinitely. On the other hand, it might be used for just about anything. And it's certainly within the power of central banking to reshape the world economy in a wholesome direction, something I haven't thought of, something none of us have thought of. Um, so we shouldn't um, immediately uh, criticize, criticize them on that. And then lastly, um, we're going through a, a, a new enlightenment, a great enlightenment in the world because of the internet. It transforms all of soft power. Um, and um, the experience of the past is going to lead the Russians to think that they can convince us of God knows anything uh, by having a network that's better than our news networks. And they're on the way with RT. I'm not saying it's better, but it's more exciting uh, than the rest of our news networks. It covers more uh, international affairs. And the Russians probably have the idea they're going to really change our our opinions, and they're really going to take advantage of us <laughs> with, with regard to this. But the experience of Glasnost was when you try to take advantage by opening things up at home, you end up listening to your own propaganda, and it transforms you just, just as much. And I think this will happen to the Russians. So people are not going to learn from people are not going to learn from history. And I guess finally, I should say there is a final, final a remark. Finally, I should say, maybe we've been having the wrong argument about um, geopolitics and geoeconomics. Um, maybe it isn't just a question of globalism on the one side and maybe state power on the other. That's the way I've been putting it for a while. Maybe that's not so, not so clever, I think. Uh, maybe all roads are leading to globalization. Uh, maybe it's possible for the rise of new states uh, to lead to some other model of globalization. Maybe there, it's promise, uh, possible for compromises on the road to globalization, uh, new arrangements, and there need not be the kind of antagonism that uh, we've expected uh, from, the, from the era. Um, in short then, um, uh, it's good to learn from history, and it's good to recognize uh, the, uh, the continuities in history. Uh, but it's also good to recognize the discontinuities and good to recognize what history does not teach. Excellent, Anthony. Many, many thanks. Questions Excellent, and comments? Uh, overview of, of hegemony in the literal political sense.
and uh, the talk Taylor made for our conference theme. We'll start with, with Paul Pitlick. Sorry, Paul, it's hard to hear. One of your comments towards the end was about how it may be in his mind's interest to have our conflicts between some of the Russian houses. In fact, aren't the number of conflicts actually reducing what we're reading in the newspapers and how bad things are, but that's what sells the newspaper. You, look at you think they're being reduced? Sorry? You think the conflicts are being reduced? No, this is not. I don't know what's the data. I, I seem to recall that if you have the number of conflicts. I think the level of antagonism between us and Russia uh, has increased enormously from what it was in the 1990s. No. That's right. That's right. It's not armed yet. Well, it's, uh, it is armed up to a point. The people we're arming are fighting the people they're arming. Well, it's not familiar. Pardon? But again, there are there are hundreds of these conflicts in the world. How many others have a dozen? Well, look, look at Latin America, for example. This is this is a thought. They're minimal now. This is a thought. I I know some data that there was a few years ago. It added over historically the number of conflicts. We don't read that in newspapers because that doesn't sell newspapers. Hmm. What sells newspapers is look how dangerous the world is. Uh, Paul, I might be tempted to put that in the same category of um, um, uh, Norman Angel and uh, and the others who wrote before World War One that uh, conflict was going away, that imperialism was solving all of its problems, and maybe there wouldn't be a big blow. And then, more or less, uh, uh, countries can't fight because it's really not in their interest. It isn't in their interest. But that's a thought, though. Uh, uh, yes. I think that's Seth. I think that's an interesting perception that you know the conflicts are going down, they're going up, and I think we have uh, I mean, how can we learn from history the sort of paradoxical view? I, I think I would say that there are far more than half a dozen conflicts around the world. Not to be mistaken, but I think if you just look at Africa, there are far more than half a dozen right now, if I remember for and as well as most places in the world. I think it's things that we do hear about and don't hear about, both in the present and in the story. We had uh, Cheeky and then Bob and then Ed. Yeah, if we distinguish between interstate and intrastate warfare, I mean, I, I know it's. Intrastate? You mean revolution? Versus interstate warfare. You mean revolution and civil war? Civil wars, yeah. yeah. There has been a decline of interstate warfare. But there has been an increase of interstate warfare. When you think of Africa, most of the, much of the action is within states. It doesn't mean that uh, I, I approve of it or it's cool or it's fine. I'm just saying that, in fact, is what's happening. Interstate warfare. That's right. In Africa, we really don't have uh, warfare between states on a, on a decent scale, on a large scale. <laughs> decent scale. <laughs> on a large scale. <laughs> uh, Bob. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I accept your point that, that history really isn't a guide for the modern world. I mean, after all, I mean, there are certain things going on in this world. You mentioned the internet and, and all these other things, where global trade is 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 everywhere. I mean, it's global. I mean, but I, I still think it has a value in a sense of of what is it, Rumsfeld? What what, what was the it? Global trade? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, it, because I mean. Right now, in this country, basically half our clothes, if not more, are made in China. Um, clothes are made in Malaysia and, and, and the Philippines and in all kinds of different places to be shipped here. It used to be we all did this right here. I mean, this is an expansion of the global trade. It's no longer the mercantile thing. But, but it can be weaponized. Yeah. It can be weaponized. weaponized. But we have a market that uh, China depends on. And yeah. Uh, we have the ability to deny her that market and, well, they, and give, them, give that market, market to others. No, they need it to sell us, I believe. That's, that's because, what I think, too. Yeah. But the other thing is is that what I'm saying is with the use of history. It is sort of like the Rumsfeld thing of you don't know what you don't know, but at least you might know what you do know, and what you don't know, you might know that. And I'm not saying it's a big guide, but it, it, it certainly helps to eliminate some of the chaff in some of the things. If another Munich came up, 
I mean, is that a good deal or not for today? I don't know. I'm not going to be answering that. I don't know the situation. But it's, it, it's good to have that kind of a historical analysis of what it led to. Well, you know, uh, my trade union uh, uh, would be very unhappy with me if I were, were to say that people shouldn't read history. <laughs> but, uh, okay. but, but you know, uh, I, I was very encouraged when I first heard that Vladimir Putin was uh, reading a lot of history, but now I find out the history he's reading is, uh, is teaching him a, the most primitive kind of, uh, uh, how to put it, Byzantine Caesaropapism and, uh, you know, crawling on your belly. Russian nationalism. So, and he's learning history. So he loves history. But <laughs> Peter the Great. Uh, we have Ed Yaiko. Um, I just want to add to the number of conflicts. There's far more than a half dozen in the Middle East itself, and stretching into Southeast Asia, you've got a whole bunch of others. And I can't see the difference between interstate and intrastate conflicts. And of course, in the Middle East, you've got conflicts between non-state outfits. Conflicts, and which sounds good when you first hear it. Uh, you know, you want to keep a conflict from turning into a general conflict, of course. On the other hand, it also means isolating some poor nation and allowing some other uh, poor nation to pounce on it when maybe you can do something about it, I don't know, without a general war. Um, so. Uh, bienvenido, and then John. Uh, okay, this is for those conflicts, whether it's Asia or uh, inter uh, state wars, where does failed states and failing states come in? Is there, is there any idea of examining these countries that, in fact, they might be them a failed or failing states? I mean, that's why you I mean, where does globalization or uh, you know, the history that I've studied doesn't have too much uh, in the way of examples of uh, failing states. Um, you mean like Somalia today or something like that? Or, yeah, you could say Syria. Well, in that sense, maybe you would say Spain was a failing state in, the, in, the, in 36 through 9. I guess my question is, why does the international community or the rich countries continue to recognize them as sovereign, independent? Right? I haven't got the answer to this. Uh, you know, um, sentimentally, uh, you want to do something about it. I was enthusiastic uh, about um, about the uh, bombing of, um, of Colonel Gaddafi. Uh, I thought it was something the United States could do. Uh, and I thought Gaddafi was intent on uh, conducting a massacre on a vast scale. Uh, He's going to murder a whole city worth of people, I thought. And uh, so I thought it was a good idea to bomb uh, to bomb Libya. Uh, now we haven't got anything decent in Libya to boast about. And the people who argued for that line, along with me, Samantha Power and, and others, you know, are starting to wonder why they why they thought that. I said, it's very it's a very difficult thing, humanitarian intervention, a very difficult thing. You can make big mistakes. Yes, uh, John will have the final question. So. It seems to me the premise for the idea of the balance of power is of the nation state as the primary actor in international relations. Uh, in terms of the interests of various states, to use sort of Marxist rhetoric, the sort of interest of the various bourgeoisies of the various states in competition across, across a global scale. I'm wondering. What do we do with the concept or the idea of the balance of power when the nature of armed conflict is multiple insurgencies based not on a sort of perceived national interest of a nation state or a national bourgeoisie, but rather of sort of multiple, for want of a better word, identity or um, ver various groups with various kinds of grievances are being articulated both against within the nation state and against the international order mm -hmm. in various, uh, mm -hmm. understood in various ways. Um, so uh, what, what do I hear something, I hear something in what you're saying that I can respond to, and not everything that you're saying. Could but, you repeat it, the question, please, for the online audience? Ooh, repeating it. <laughs> <laughs> it was very complex. 
It was very complex. I guess. This I'll hour, read, Roman, I'll, that's a hard thing to do. I'll, think, but, I'll, I'll, re I'll, I'll repeat the part that I'll spoke to me uh, okay. and for which I have a uh, response. Okay. <laughs> um, the, the balance of power um, throughout uh, its history uh, has uh, been a theory of war, not a theory of stability, uh, not a theory of peace or anything like that. It's a theory of war. Uh, you create a balance by war. And that's the way it has actually worked uh, right up until nuclear weapons. Now we talk about a balance of power and we say, well, no war will have deterrence instead. I don't know if that can be done. In other words, I, I, this deterrence thing is the big problem uh, for me. Um, so that would be my that would be my answer to that. Thank you, Anthony.